This is the Kaibalian and Physics Part 7, Creation. So I spent five videos explaining the atomic model and applying it to nature and reality. I spent the sixth video pointing out all the problems with quantum physics. But now I'd like to spend the seventh talking about the big questions, things that we kind of know but maybe we're not sure of, and then especially the ones that people have been asking for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. The answers come from the logic of the seven principles found on the Kaibalian. So let's start with the origin of stars. As we know, stars are born in enormous celestial clouds of space dust called nebulae, or nebula for singular, following the logic of all that an atom is capable of, which is caused by attraction and repel. Here is an explanation for how stars are born. It starts with the largest body in a galaxy, a giant black body which all stars orbit around. As we know, these enormous black bodies suck in heat and light, but they do not spin fast enough to ignite, and this was explained in the episode 3, Giant Atoms. So, if they take in enough heat and light, we're talking about black bodies, or dark black holes, its balancing energy would carry out the excess through one of the waves much like giving birth. At that point, these gigantic black bodies are no longer magnetic, but radioactive, at least during the birth of such a particle. The balancing energy of such a large body would almost certainly have enormous waves. Such a wave could carry a very large particle of excited light. When such a particle comes through a nebula, the inward parts of the atoms in that nebula would be attracted to it, forming a large body as they surround it. Then the large particle becomes the nucleus of a large atom. Since the singularity created by the large particle was so gigantic, the inward parts of atoms would release their singularities to surround the larger one, creating an even bigger body. The released heat and light would either get repelled and or the balancing energy produced would take it back to the nucleus, allowing it to grow. A black body in a nebula will grow until there is no more matter to attract towards it. Then centrifugal force kicks in which is when a star would ignite. This process would be the same for planets and moons, as above, so below. Because these large bodies revolve around a star, they do not tend to spin nor move fast enough to pull the inward energy outward, which is what allows for atoms, simple and complex, to form a planetary body. Stars are more masculine as they release heat and light. Black bodies are more feminine as they take in heat and light. Masculine and feminine exists on all levels. So let's talk about the universe. The question, is it expanding or contracting? According to the principle of rhythm, the universe is expanding and contracting like a heartbeat or the ocean tide coming in and out. All things have rhythm like the swing of a pendulum. The Big Bang is a theory that all outward forces were released from one point to create all things. It does not take into account that light has an opposite, dark inward energy, as expressed by the laws of nature. Two outward forces will never come together to create matter. They would simply scatter because masculine energy naturally repels itself. The big separation would be a better description of the Big Bang Theory. Because of the rule of opposites, inward energy would also be collected before the release, but from the outside going in. This is, of course, assuming that such a thing is possible. The big release would involve outward and inward energy coming together to create all things, to create the universe, moved by the attraction shared by all of nature, the attraction between masculine and feminine. The space between the two is where the universe was created and exists, but who knows if this is possible. And I don't really put my money on the Big Bang Theory. Here's a different theory. And hopefully you'll understand it. Neither of those theories explain how light came to be. A possible theory based on the first law of nature is that, at the start of all things, there was nothing but darkness and consciousness, meaning self-awareness. Principle 1. The all is mind. The universe is mental. Even in the Bible, light is the first verbal act of creation, while the darkness was described as already being there. Did this consciousness pull in the nothingness of cold darkness, creating dark energy? As explained in this project, dark energy does not produce heat nor light. It is cold darkness moving in an inward pattern. Or perhaps feminine energy was there first, or always was. 
which gave birth to the universe. As we know, based on nature, life starts out as female before the sex chromosome kicks in, as above, so below. If so, at one point the dark energy spun fast enough to turn itself outward, to turn into light, but it would not be a point, rather a circle or sphere. This allows for a creation at more than one point throughout the universe. Now we're going to talk about an even bigger question, the source of life. This is one of those things that people have been wondering about for a very long time. Although it was discovered and named after a man, the Fibonacci sequence is the outward measurement of the natural spiral shared by all of life. The ratio between these numbers shows up wherever there is life because it is the outward manifestation of feminine energy. It is also called the golden ratio, or phi. The phi spiral shows us that inward feminine energy, or dark energy, has width before it goes in on itself, unlike the pi spiral. Feminine energy manifests itself in all life because all life comes from females. All life must pass through a female to exist. Dark inward feminine energy is the source of life. Indeed, who put wisdom in the inward parts? That's a quote from the Bible. And there you go. One of the simplest answers to one of the greatest questions. And it all had to do with understanding the correct atomic model, which is actually very simple. These questions are actually very simple. And I'll continue and show you. Let's talk about masculine energy. The pattern of movement in lightning, outward balancing energy, can be found in tree branches, plants, roots, the circulatory system, which extends from the heart, or even the nervous system, which extends from the brain. Cycle of life. The way that balancing energy recycles also manifests greatly throughout nature. It is found in food chains, life cycles, or behaviors from birth to old age and death. Here's something very interesting about the ancient Hindu culture. They have something called the Om. Just as balancing energy vibrates and shares its recycling properties with life, the ancient Hindu culture believed that there was a vibration in which all life shares. It is called the Om. So here's a few thousand years of reference. Although the idea that energy is positive and negative has been assumed for over a century and fiercely defended by physicists, there are at least a few thousand years of references that relate that creation, or energy, is masculine and feminine. The Taoist yin and yang symbol represents opposites through masculine and feminine. The ancient Celtic culture worshipped the divine masculine and feminine. In fact, most creation stories begin with the separation of a male and female, or a male and female god that come together to create everything else. The Egyptian myths start with Ra separating heaven and earth, Shu and Tefnut. The Japanese myths start with Izanagi and Izanami. The Greeks have Gea and Uranus. Even the ancient Hebrew name, Yahweh, also means masculine and feminine. A few thousand years of reference versus a century of thinking a certain way. Who is correct? Let's talk about the number seven. This one's fun. The number seven shows up throughout nature. There are seven days in a week, seven seas, seven continents, seven colors in a rainbow, seven musical notes before they repeat in a different octave, and seven holes in the head. There are even seven virtues and seven deadly sins. Oddly enough, there are even seven major planets. Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Believe it or not, Mercury is the Sun's actual moon, and it is only just slightly larger than the Earth's moon. Mercury is not a major planet, it is a moon. In fact, the Sumerians believed it. There is a tale called the Enuma Elish, and I really, really, really studied that one. Put out a book and a video about it. If you want to check it out, it's amazing what the Sumerians believed. In the Bible, there are seven days of creation. Even the more ancient myth of creation, the Sumerian, Enuma Elish, was written on seven tablets. It is certainly fun to think about and find more examples of. There are plenty. More importantly, there are seven laws of nature. The seven-pointed star symbolizes nature. All right. Well, if you like your religion and you think that it makes you a good person, please turn off this video now and thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope I was able to share something with you. And if you want to 
But anyways, if you believe that, just turn off the video. I'll give you seven seconds. Okay, you're still here. So we're gonna get into the very big questions. And the reason I gave that warning is because some people might get upset and this is not an attack on anybody. It is an attack on religious ideals, ideologies. So this is upsetting to a lot of people. Um, I know this because I've been bringing this up to my father for a few years now and he's had a hard time accepting it even though the atomic model that I provided answered everything in a really simple way. <sighs> does the soul exist? No, it does not. The idea of the soul does not pass the laws of nature. It's not masculine and feminine, it doesn't vibrate, it doesn't have waves, it doesn't go into rhythm, none of it. Energy has everything to do with life, and I just showed you that. However, there are no invisible, immortal copies of ourselves, the way that a flower does not have one. Although many believe it to be true, the soul does not exist because energy is already the source of life, as well as intelligence. Principle one, the all is mind, the universe is mental. Besides, alternate realities do not exist, including spiritual realms. Everything can be proven in this reality. As I've expressed in the last six videos, the institutions that say these things need to be questioned and re-examined, as none of them ever explain how nature works, while even making good people look forward to death. And that's the saddest part. But what did Jesus say about gravity? What did Muhammad say about gravity? Mm -hmm. The word for soul translated in the Bible comes from the ancient Hebrew word nefesh. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Which simply meant living being. Although it pertains to intelligent beings, it did not have anything to do with invisible copies of intelligent beings or afterlife. That did not start until the additions to the Torah, including the New Testament, which resulted in the Bible. Interestingly enough, the God of the biblical Abraham never promised immortality, only longevity through bloodlines. Again, that was changed with the stories that came after. So, let's talk about the universe then. The first law of nature states... The all is mind. The universe is mental. This means that the universe rules itself and is self-created. It implies that the universe was created through its own thought and will process. Artful works denote intelligence. There is plenty of proof as we gaze the heavens with advanced technology or by simply observing nature. Our inward and outward energy, the breath of this intelligence, is everything alive. Energy is masculine and feminine, and nature is created in that image. Life is a part of nature, and energy creates life. All things exist within the laws of nature. The greatest thing in the universe is the universe itself. There is nothing outside of it as it encompasses everything. The universe is the all of which the total sum is one. Energy cannot be destroyed, only changed. The universe was here long before us and will continue to be here long after we are gone. If immortality is possible, it is only possible for the universe. Here, the word universe and God are interchangeable. Everything, including you, is a part of this universe, the only one experiencing itself through all things. So then what? If no man or God rules nature, if nature rules itself and is self-created, if alternate realities do not exist, if souls do not exist, some have asked, then what is the purpose of being good? The answer is simple. It is a choice. The same way adults make choices and take responsibility for those decisions. We humans, as a species, must finally become adults, choosing to be good for no other reason than to be so. Goodness is the reward. We no longer need false hope or false promises to ensure our good nature. It is a choice because we are free. It is most certainly a great responsibility to, to declare that invisible realms and souls do not exist. What code of goodness will benefit society then? While searching through the ancient cultures to see what they believed, an answer was found that was satisfying and logical. And remember, I learned physics by studying the ancient past. 
So this is a part of what I learned, and I'm very honored to share this with you. You will recognize that they are very similar to the Ten Commandments. It is very interesting that the ancient Hebrew word, Yahweh, also means masculine and feminine. It's if that word means nature or universe. In time and through translations, that word was changed to Lord, all capital letters. Applying the meaning of that name towards the Ten Commandments resulted with an understanding that was satisfactory. The excess was stripped away to its simplicity. The last two were added for obvious reasons. Since I am no God nor anything else other than a random human, I have no power to command anything or anyone. I humbly offer you this, 12 principles for free beings, us humans. Besides, we are meant to be free, even mentally. They are only principles, nothing more. It can be a personal code if you so choose, or not. You are free, after all. Consider an equation for society that promotes restraint to ensure freedom. With regard to worship, nature does not require it or demand it of anything or anyone, although respect, reverence, gratitude, and honor are always good. You are free to interact with the universe as you see fit. No other being can ever be an intermediary between you and God. Not an imam, not a priest, not a rabbi. You, yourself, have direct contact with God, communication with God. No one can take that away from you. No one. The highest source of intelligence is always aware. So here they are, the 12 principles for free beings. And I painted out a pizza because you can share pizza. There's 12 slices. Number one, there is nothing but the universe or nature. Well, if you're so inclined, there is nothing but God. We are living in it. We don't die to meet God. We're living in it. This is our interaction with God. So most people believe that God is a he, a masculine figure based on the Bible. And here I am telling you that the universe or nature is both masculine and feminine. So that means I am equating God to being both masculine and feminine, but it's not an androgynous thing. It's more like your parental units or your biological mother and your biological father. Two came together to create one, to create you. So God is like your parents, the great mother and the great father. The Holy Trinity and then would be the great mother, the great father, and you. You see? Modern religions do not equate the feminine side of nature into their equations, and that's very strange to me. Number two, do not worship. It is mental slavery. Something I never understood is why would God give you free will and then tell you that you need to bend the knee, that you need to bow? That's not something God would say. In fact, I'd say the opposite. Something someone very bad would say. You're going to have to reconcile that one on your own. It's up to you. You are free after all. Number three, do not take nature in vain. In other words, don't take nature for granted. Number four, rest every seven days. Besides, it's good for your health and it honors nature. Number five, honor your parents or your teachers. Number six, do not kill. Number seven, do not steal, including other people especially children. Number eight, do not commit adultery. Honor your relationship with whomever you love. Number nine, do not covet. Do not want something that is not yours, including other people. Number 10, do not lie. Number 11, do not hate. And number 12, do not forget. Thank you so much for your time. God bless you.